So then today is Pentecost Sunday. And the epistle is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. When the days of Pentecost were accomplished, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a mighty wind coming, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them parted tongues as it were of fire, and it sat upon every one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with diverse tongues, according as the Holy Ghost gave them to speak. Now there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation, under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded in mind, because that every man heard them speak in his own tongue. And they were all amazed and wondered, saying, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? And how have we heard every man our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews also and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we have heard them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. In the Gospel, stand for the Gospel. Taking that according to St. John chapter 14. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and will make our abode in him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my words. And the word which you have heard is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you, abiding with you. But the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring all things to your mind whatsoever I shall have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. You have heard that I said to you, I go away and I come unto you. If you love me, you would indeed be glad, because I go to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it shall come to pass, you may believe. I will not now speak many things with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and in me he hath not anything, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and the Father hath given me commandment, so do I. Those are the words of today's Holy Gospel. Well, in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today is Pentecost Sunday, this May the 27th, in March, the end of the last great Rosary Crusade today, supposed to have completed our 130 million rosaries, or however many of million rosaries are supposed to have said before today. And in the last few weeks, there have been announcements. Announcements, particularly since the end of April, about the great miracle that is supposed to happen today. Maybe it is happening right now, because here at 6 p.m. in the Philippines, it's 11 in the morning, 10 in the morning in Rome. The miracle of the reunification. The miracle of the regularization of the Society of St. Bias X. They have said that the Pope will make an announcement probably by today. But a few days ago, Bishop Blay told one of the other bishops that he was worried that it may not happen today because of the leaking of the letters on April the 7th 
three bishops, Bishop Williamson, Bishop de Galaretta, and Bishop Sissia de Mallory, wrote a letter to Bishop Fillet telling him, do not make a deal with modernist Rome. Do not sleep with the modernists. Stand firm in the line of Archbishop Marcel de Femme. Rome has not converted, and it is not at this time converting. We must stand firm for the truth as we have for the last 40 years, and do not go to bed with the modernists, because if we do, they will make us modernists. We will not convert them. And Bishop Fillet wrote back in response to the three bishops, stating that I'm very concerned about you three bishops because you sound like Sadie the Contest, as if you have no confidence in the Holy Father. And I would have told you many things, but I'm hurt that you don't seem to agree with me. And in conclusion, you three bishops created a dialectic, dialectic meaning a conflict, a fight, between the truth and faith on one side and authority on the other. And this is against the spirit of the priesthood. Those are the words of Bishop Fillet to the three bishops in the letter of April the 14th, 2012, on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. And it may be very symbolic indeed, because on this day, the SSPX ship is in danger of sinking. We are in the most perilous times since the foundation of our society. And it's being hailed as a miracle. You've been prepared for this day by miracles and miracles and miracles. But if we look back over the gospel, we will find that our Lord said in Matthew chapter 24, there will be many signs and wonders in the last days to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Many signs and wonders. The first miracle was announced in 2007. It was the miracle of Samorum Pontificum and the result of the first Rosary Crusade. What was this miracle? We were praying the rosary, primarily that the Pope would consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart in the fulfillment of the request of Our Lady of Fatima. But instead what happened was, the Pope released the Morum Pontificum, in which he said, the Latin Mass was never abrogated. And so, Bishop Belay and Menzingen told us this was a great miracle. It was a miracle of your rosaries. You must have confidence in the miracle of the rosaries. It was not a miracle. What does the Mormon Difficum say? The Mormon Difficum says, the Latin Mass is never abrogated. And therefore, I, Pope Benedict XVI, give a general permission to celebrate the Latin Mass, which permission I expect to be implemented by September 14, 2007. In other words, the Mass was never abrogated, which means you do not need permission. But, I am giving you permission, the permission you don't need, and the permission is being given because of my gracious charity as Pope, and I expect this permission to be put into practice by September the 14th, 
In other words, when I said it was never abrogated, that was a lie. And then he adds conditions. This general permission to celebrate the Latin Tridentine Mass is under conditions. And the first condition is, you must accept the new Mass as the ordinary rite of the Church. And the old Mass, the true Mass, is extraordinary, which means only tolerated in special circumstances. And this is an abomination. The Blessed Virgin Mary does not approve of the new Mass. The Blessed Virgin Mary does not accept the new Mass as ordinary, and she does not accept the true sacrifice of the Mass of her Son as something only extraordinary. And she doesn't accept that the Mass is only by the grace and permission of Pope Benedict XVI. The Mass is the center of our worship as Catholics, and it has been around for 2,000 years, and it doesn't depend on Benedict XVI. It was not a miracle, but it was hailed as such. Mary has heard your prayer. And then comes the second miracle, the lifting of the excommunications announced on January 23rd, 2009. Four bishops had their excommunications lifted. And Bishop Valet asked that we sing the Te Deum. Many priests refused throughout the whole world. But he asked that we sing the Te Deum in thanksgiving for the lifting of the excommunications of the four bishops. Now, if you go back and see the pictures of the event back in 1988, you will discover that there were six bishops involved. There was Bishop the Castro Meyer, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, and the four bishops. And all six of them were declared excommunicated. And the excommunication is lifted only for four of them, which means that according to Rome, neo-modernist Rome, Bishop de Castro Meyer and Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre remain excommunicated. They are right now in heaven. But according to the Pope, they remain excommunicated. And for what? For celebrating the Latin Tridentine Mass, which was never abrogated. If he really meant it was never abrogated back in 2007, then that would mean all those who received punishment because it was believed to be abrogated, their punishments were null and void. And four bishops, or other six bishops, were punished because they celebrated the Latin Tridentine Mass. And because they you know, consecrated bishops so that priests could be ordained to continue to celebrate that Mass and to preserve the Catholic faith in the Church. It is another abomination. Six bishops are excommunicated, so-called, and they lift four of them, reclaiming the other two are lifted, are not, their excommunication remains. And furthermore, we have another problem. You cannot have your excommunication lifted unless you are excommunicated. As I mentioned a few weeks ago in the Behold in the Cebu sermon, you cannot have resurrection, you cannot rise from the dead unless you are dead. If you are not dead, you cannot rise. So likewise, if you are not excommunicated, you cannot have the excommunication lifted. Bishop de Castromeyer, Archbishop Lefebvre, and the other four bishops were never excommunicated. Therefore, the excommunication could not be lifted, and it was not a miracle. It was a confusion, it was a deception to soften the hearts 
and to weaken the will of the Catholics defending the faith. And then doctrinal talks. Now we're going to make a deal. And after the doctrinal talks, it was declared Rome has not changed its position. Rome still believes in modernism. Rome is still rejecting the faith. And the society is still holding the faith. Nothing has changed. So says Bishop Pillay. And now it's changed. Now we've got to make a deal. Now we're going to be accepted and regularized. Now we're going to receive a personal prelature. And all the documents are secret. And all the communications are secret. And all the going back and forth is secret. You don't keep truth a secret. You don't keep good a secret. But you do keep lies a secret. And you do keep evil a secret. And you keep deception a secret. That's why all the secrecy of the last several years. Because if Bishop Vallee and Father Fulger and Father Nelly, the superiors of the Society of St. Pius X, stood up boldly and told the truth to us a year ago or two years ago, everyone would have rebelled. And so they said, have confidence. You don't know all the details. You're just foolish, stupid, idiotic, moronic sheep. And your job is to never think, only pay, pray, and obey. You don't need to know your faith. You need to have confidence in the Holy Superior. You don't need to know what he's doing with your faith. There are secret communications. What are these secret communications about? They are about the faith. And the faith was not meant to be placed under a bushel, so said Jesus Christ, but upon the candle stand. The faith is meant to be publicly confessed and publicly professed and unto the time of death. Now they avoided heresy, they avoided heretical statements until the last two weeks. Now the deal is almost done. The betrayal is almost complete. And they think we can do nothing about it anymore. And they have the iron fist of Menzingen holding over us. Father Cardoza, a Spanish priest, Argentinian priest, I believe, in, Ar in, in South America. He preached against the agreement a month and a half ago, and now he can no longer say Mass in a society church. Now he's living in a monastery. Now he is in exile. Prepare for the iron fist to come down again. And for those that do not count out, we have been asked to be silent. We don't know the deal. We don't know the circumstances. We don't know the details. Why not? I'll read to you the details. When Bishop Flay was in uh, Austria, he spoke to one of the priests, telling him about the deal. The personal prelature told him about the deal. Then that priest told the faithful. And that faithful put it on the internet. Here's the deal. Now remember, these are only rumors. So far, every other rumor has turned out to be true. Because Menzingen is telling us nothing. When a rumor comes out, they verify that it's true. Here's the latest. What is in the deal, the personal prelature? Number one, 
the Pope will decide on who will be bishops of the SSPX. Who will replace those who leave or who do not choose to go along with the agreement? Those bishops will be free to leave and they will be replaced. Who are those bishops? Bishop Williamson, Bishop de Galaretta, and Bishop Tissier de Mallory. They are free to leave and they will be replaced. Who decides? His name is now Pope Benedict XVI. He became a cardinal in 1981. Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. And since that time, he has devoted his cardinal life to destroying Catholic tradition. He was the one that arranged a deal in 1987 for a small group called Mater Dei, nine seminarians that left our Archbishop to form a small group in Rome, and it fell apart. They were deceived. Cardinal Ratzinger was the one who promised Dom Girard, who was the closest friend, Benedictine monk, and the closest friend of Bishop, Archbishop Lefebvre, to betray Archbishop Lefebvre in 1988, not go along with the consecrations. And he told Dom Girard, you want me to visit your monastery? I will make you an abbot. But you have to come to Rome, and you, Dom Gerard, have to come celebrate the new Mass with the Pope, and I'll be there watching you to make sure you really come celebrate. Dom Gerard agreed because he wanted to be an abbot. He died with his abbot's mitre three years ago. What was the price? How much did it cost? Who was the one that arranged the betrayal? Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. 1989 or 1990, Monsignor Waugh comes to Rome. I want to start a traditional institute which we will call the Institute of Christ the King. Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger tells him, you can start your institute after you come celebrate a new Mass with me. Let me see you come celebrate the new Mass. Then I'll sign your agreement. I'll make you approved. That same year, Bishop Zanet comes from Yugoslavia. He visits Rome. He visits Cardinal Ratzinger, and he says, Cardinal Ratzinger, you are the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and I am the Bishop of Medjugorje in Yugoslavia. And in Medjugorje, they are liars. In Medjugorje, they are enemies of God. In Medjugorje, the priest is sleeping with nuns. In Medjugorje, it is a fake miracle, and people are coming from all over the world, and I have condemned it, but they won't listen to me. Can you please make a public proclamation from Rome, condemning Medjugorje? And you know what Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger said? Zanuck, you take care of it. There are too many friends of Medjugorje here. I will not condemn it. But I agree with you. His name was Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. The year 2000. The lying releasing of the third secret of Fatima. Cardinal Bertoni makes the announcement. Lies to the world and tells them we are releasing the third secret when they knew it was a lie. Who was sitting next to him? Who was in charge? Who was the man in charge? His name was Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, the head of the congregation with the doctrine of the faith. He led Bartoni to the dirty talking. But he was the one in charge, and he sat there while Bartoni spoke a lie. Who is the most responsible man in the Catholic Church for suppressing the secret of Fatima? He used to be called Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. He now goes by Pope Benedict XVI. 
He will be the one to choose our new bishops. Now, number two. No new structures are allowed to be erected without the approval of the diocesan bishops. Do you think Bishop Carpaglia will approve of our new church? Do we want to build down to the bottom of the hill? Do you think the new bishop will approve of our new church at the bottom of the hill? No new structures without the permission of the diocesan bishops. That is the death of the growth of tradition. Number three, it gets better. Be patient. Any buildings less than three years old must be closed down. Any buildings older than three years old may remain up and running. I was a pastor in Denver, Colorado, and we built a church there large church called St. Isidore's. It was completed in 2001. That's more than three years ago, so the building can be saved. But it became a priory only three years ago, and the priory building, which is on a different property, was donated to the society a year and a half ago. Will the priests in the Denver Priory have to leave their priory. And what about Davao? What about Jensan? What about all of Mindanao, all of Leyte, all of Bohol and Cebu? Are we really here, canonically speaking? The Society of St. Pius X doesn't own any property in these areas, except for the one at the bottom of the hill, but that's less than three years, and there's no church there. We own only property in Manila, and in Iloilo, and in Bacolod. So maybe the society is only in Manila, Iloilo, and Bacolod, and maybe we're not canonically here. So maybe we've got to ask permission to keep saying Mass in Genzon. To go and visit the stranded faithful in Zamboanga. And now we've got to know, can I go and bring Jesus Christ to the souls in need? Please give me permission. I'm so sorry. But the bishop said, you can go to hell. I'm so sorry. Or I'm so happy. The bishop allowed me to be a Catholic priest. You should also be happy because the bishop allowed you to be Catholic. As we mentioned a couple of months ago, when you get married, you come before the priest and you kneel down in front of the altar. And you say, I do, in front of the priest and in front of the altar. And you are married until death do you part. You don't come back to Father seven years later. Father, can I still be married? It's done. It's finished. Live a miserable life until you die. You can't change it. So likewise, when we are baptized, we're Catholic. And no pope can take away my Catholic faith. And no bishop can take away my Catholic faith. And no priest can take away my Catholic faith. And no king and no magistrate and no authority can take away my Catholic faith. But now we got to ask permission to be Catholic. 
On June 13th, 1988, Archbishop Lefebvre gave a talk to the four bishops. One of them was Bishop Bernard Follet. And at the end of his talk, which was recorded, he said, the saints and the martyrs always had to choose between faith and authority. They chose faith over authority. That was in 88. In 2012, Bishop Fillet says, you three bishops make a dialectic between truth and faith on the one side and authority on the other. And this is against the spirit of the priesthood. In other words, authority can never be against faith. And if there seems to be a conflict between authority and faith, you must obey the authority. That is exactly the opposite of what Archbishop Lefebvre said to four bishops elect. Did he forget what the Archbishop told him 24 years ago? And now the errors. The warning was from many priests and from the three bishops. Bishop Fillet, do not go to bed with the modernists because when you lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. If we make a deal with Rome, we will enter into the Roman mystery and we will become modernists. Modernists will not become Catholic. It's already happened. On May the 11th, 2012, CNN, Catholic News Service, visited Menzingen, Switzerland. Many priests have tried calling there, but they don't answer the phone. The priests of Mexico, who are completely against this foolish agreement, have tried to call Menzingen. They've tried to get a message through to Menzingen, but they're not available. They're not available. But they were available for the Novus Ordo Catholic News Service, and they had lots of time to talk to Bishop Blair. The video cameras came in, and the bright lights. And one of the main liberal outlets of communication of heresy in the United States. And the Catholic News Service asked Bishop Fillet some questions. What do you think about the SSPX versus Rome? Is there a fight between the SSPX and Rome? And Bishop Fillet said no. There is no battle between SSPX and Rome. That's not the right way to look at it. It's rather that there are some bad men in positions of authority. What about the council? USSPX people are always against the council, Vatican II. What about the council? And Bishop Belay said these words, quote, we learned from the doctrinal discussions that what we would have before condemned as an error of the council was in fact not an error of the council, but only an error of the common interpretation of the council. Let's go over that again. There's nothing wrong with the council. The only problem is the abuses and the bad interpretation of the council. This has been the line of the liberal Novus Ordo for the last 50 years. Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre in 1965 wrote a book called I Accuse the Council. Not, I accuse those people that have a bad interpretation of the council. Not, I accuse a misunderstanding of the council. I accuse the council. The council teaches error. 
the council teaches heresy, particularly the error of religious liberty and ecumenism. But Bishop Belay learned from the doctrinal talks that what we have taught over the last 40 years is incorrect. He's already converting. He says he's going to go in to convert the modernists, but he's already speaking modernist language. And then the CNS reporter asked him, what about religious liberty? We know for you SSPX guys, you don't like religious liberty. So Bishop Belay, tell us about religious liberty in the council. And Bishop Belay said, the religious liberty, as it is defined in the council, is a very, very limited liberty. It's very limited. If you go to the regular restaurant, if you go to Mong in the South, you get unlimited rice. If you go to a regular restaurant, you get limited rice. And Bishop Belay says, the liberty spoken of in the council is very limited. Religious liberty, as it is spoken in Vatican Council II, is not limited, it's heretical. It's wrong. It's against the 2,000 year teaching of our church. It leads to the damnation of souls and has led to it down the last 50 years. And one of the effects of this false idea that a man has a right to believe what's wrong is that millions of souls have left the church. I just picked up three Protestant ministers. I didn't know they were ministers at the time. But there were three guys on the side of the road, and behold, when I was dropping off by the Tim, so I picked them up, and they wanted to go into town and brought them into town. Turned out they were three Protestant ministers. They're in Hong Kong, and they're very happy with their ecumenical relations with the Catholic Church in Hong Kong. Ecumenism and the fall of religious liberty is alive and well. And Bishop Belay says, it's limited, whereas we used to say, it's heretical. Limited means you don't get to eat as much. Heretical means it's poison. He is now speaking error publicly, and the whole world can see it. You can Google it at YouTube. The articles are available. And it's on YouTube. Catholic News Service interviewing the Superior General of the Society of St. Pius X. And then they asked him, Do you think that Vatican Council II is really a part of the great tradition of the Church? And he said, I hope so. A bishop of the church says, I hope so. This council is known well. And even the men that pronounce the council, that promote the council, they even admit this council is totally different than all the other councils. This council is not part of the great tradition of the church. This council is other. This council teaches other than what was taught before. And Bishop Belay says, Rome is changing. Rome is converting. Is Pope Benedict XVI converting? If he's converting, why is he worshiping to Mecca a few months ago? praying and bowing in the Muslim form of prayer to Mecca. John Paul II never did that. Why is Pope Benedict the Sixteenth telling the Muslims that their religion has so much to offer to us Catholics and our religion? Why is he saying to the Jews that they don't need to become a follower of Jesus Christ in order to go to heaven?
He is teaching the same heresy and the same modernism that he has always taught. Only he's an expert in subtle words. He knows the right buttons to push. He knows the right words to say to deceive traditional Catholics. Such words as never abrogated. Now Bishop Valet is telling us we don't have to change anything. We don't have to give in anything. We're going to be able to walk in without any changes. But Rome is saying you got to accept Vatican II. Now we have the doctrinal preamble. Finally, the bishops got their hands on the doctrinal preamble in the last couple of days. That secret doctrinal preamble. Ambiguities, foolishness. Well, let me give the example we gave a couple of weeks ago in the hall. It was still before ascension, so it was a Paschal candle that was here. So we'll give the example of this light. Now let us suppose I love light bulbs. I love light bulbs. And you hate light bulbs. You hate light bulbs. You hate light bulbs. I love light bulbs. So we don't get along. Because we have different ideas about light bulbs. Now, we decide that we need to become friends. So therefore, I write up a document. I declare that we love light bulbs. And you say, no, because we hate light bulbs. So you write up an agreement. And your agreement says, we hate light bulbs. And I say, no, because I like light bulbs. We got a problem. So then a wise man comes, and he says, I can make you friends. We will make another agreement, which is, you and I are near light bulbs. I agree that I'm near a light bulb. You agree you're near a light bulb. So let's be friends. Did anything change? Do you like light bulbs? No, you still hate them. Do I hate light bulbs? No, I still like them. But we made an agreement. We had a doctrinal preamble, which is called crack. Trash, meaningless garbage. And the meaningless garbage says we're both next to light bulbs. So now we're going to make a doctrinal preamble with Rome. Rome believes in modernism. Rome hates the Catholic faith. Rome is living the prophecy of Mary. And the Blessed Virgin Mary said, Rome will lose the faith. And if we unite with Rome, we also lose the faith. Mary knows more about Rome than Menzingen. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, our Holy Mother Mary, said in Quito, Ecuador, 400 years ago, that at the end of the 20th century, the priests will lose their compass. They will lose the divine compass. And the church will attack the seven sacraments, and they will abuse and destroy all seven of them. And the priests will not know what it means to be a priest of God, and there will be a great loss of faith. That's what the Blessed Virgin Mary said 400 years ago. She knew more back then than Menzingen knows today. Mary knows better. And in 1846, the Blessed Virgin Mary said, in the 20th century, Rome will lose the faith, and it will become the seat of the Antichrist. She knows better than Menzingen. According to Menzingen, it's getting better now. According to the Blessed Virgin Mary, it cannot get better until Russia is consecrated to the Immaculate Heart. Russia has not been consecrated, therefore, things are not better. And if Bishop Filet 
and the office help think things are better, they think differently than our Holy Mother. We will stick with our Holy Mother. And Blessed Virgin Mary told the people of Ecuador, the entire world, she said the same thing at La Follette. She said the same thing at Fatima. And again in Akita, Akita, Japan, most recently in 73. And Mary said, when the devil is at his greatest conquest, when it is the darkest hour, when it seems as though the kingdom of hell is about to conquer, and the kingdom of heaven is about to completely collapse, this will be my hour. This will be my hour, the hour of Mary. This will be the hour that I will show in a most magnificent way my power and crush the devil. So what do we followers of Mary believe? We followers of Mary believe that things are going to continue to get worse until she fixes it. And therefore, as the world gets worse, we have a double heart. One part of our heart is sorrowful because of the number of souls that are being lost. But another part of our heart is filled with great confidence and filled with great joy because as things get worse, it means we're getting closer to the Marian victory. The natural method that is a temptation of adultery that is being given to Menzingen right now. Go inside of Rome. Mix with the modernists. You'll be able to be a good influence. You holy SSPX priests. You wonderful SSPX priests. You're going to come in and your halo is going to glow to the modernists. I'm going to walk in. And I'm like, oh, he's so holy. I don't think I'm going to be a modernist anymore. I feel so guilty about being a modernist. It isn't going to work. Speaking with a priest classmate of mine in Mexico, a very gentle, very kind-hearted, very soft-spoken priest, he told me, is Menzigan trying to take the truth out of the mouth of the prophets? A prophet is meant to speak the truth. And how can we be a prophet if the truth is taken out of our mouths? Father Escara, professor, St. Thomas Aquinas Seminary, SSBX. Early May presents a document for all of us three on the economy of silence. That the way that St. Basil the way that St. Basil condemned the error of the Arians was by hugging them more often, by being nicer to the Arians. It's a policy of hug the heretic and he'll be better. That St. Basil didn't use offensive language. He didn't use the clear Catholic terminology because it would offend the Arians. And therefore, he found a nice way of saying the truth that wouldn't offend the Arians. Try that method with Jeremiah the prophet. Did Jesus Christ try that method? Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was in front of the Pharisees, said, You brood of vipers. When he was in front of Caiaphas on Good Friday morning, and he was about to be sent to death, he told Caiaphas, Today I go to be crucified. But behold, the day will come when you, Caiaphas, shall see the Son of Man in great power and majesty. Jesus Christ, speaking of himself. 
You, Caiaphas, will see the Son of Man coming in great power and majesty, and he shall judge you. This is going to happen at the end of the world. The prophet must speak the truth and must condemn the error. And hugging heretics does not make them into saints. We must condemn the error. And now another modernist comes forth. His name is Father Cellier. He's being brought forward in the English-speaking world for the first time. You can find him on the SSPX.org website. Father Cellier is a priest ordained by Archbishop Lefebvre in 1986. SSPX priest. In 2007, he wrote a book. And in this book, he talks about the union between the new Mass and the old, and that we could have some kind of hybrid Mass by which the new and the old could somehow mutually enrich each other. When he, when he tried to sell this book in France, the French traditional Catholics about killed him. So he had to be put on the back burner until May of 2012. Now Bishop Filet has put him forward again. Only this time, Father Cellier is teaching us the proper interpretation of the teaching of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. See, we all know that Archbishop Lefebvre said no to neo-modernist Rome. We know our system of Feb said have nothing to do with the Novus Ordo heresies. We know that he stood firmly and unequivocally for the truth against all odds. But you know what? Let's go back and look at it again, Mr. Father Cellier. Let us remember that he was speaking in specific times, according to practical circumstances that were prevalent at that time in 1975, in 1988. You know what that's called? The heresy of modernism. What do the modernists teach? The modernists teach the Council of Trent was wonderful in 1545. Vatican Council I was wonderful in 1870. They were the right medicine for the church at that time. But in the 1990s and in the 2000s, they no longer apply. Now we need a new doctrine. We need a new council. We need a new way of looking at things. Modernists believe that truth changes with history just like evolution of species. And so now Father Cellier, a priest of the Society of St. Pius X, the saint that condemned modernism, is going to use modernism in order to reinterpret Archbishop Lefebvre. And now come the re-education classes. In October of 2012, there's going to be a meeting in Kansas City in the U.S., the headquarters of the United States District of the SSPX, and they're going to talk about the papacy. There's a big banner with a smiling Pope there to the 16th. St. Pius X's picture cannot be found. We're going to learn about papal authority, or we're going to relearn. We're going to learn about the danger of city becomesism. We're going to learn about the importance of obedience, obedience, obedience. Don't stand for the faith over obedience. As of May in 2012, many, many priests of the Society of St. Pius X are worried and are firmly against this agreement but they're also afraid because of the iron fist of Menzingen that has already crushed some. I go to America next week. I come back in theory July the 5th. Will I survive the month?
This may be the summer of the divorce. And they've tried to keep it a secret until the last moment. Father Tim pointed out in a sermon last week about adultery. Adultery is a sin against the family. Adultery occurs when a man is with a woman that is not his wife. But adultery can almost also happen to a priest. A priest is a man of truth who is a follower of the truth who is Jesus Christ. And we are said to be another Christ, which means we are meant to be another walking truth. Who sees the priest should see the truth. Who hears the words of a priest should hear the words of Christ. And the words of Christ are the words of the truth. Because he said, I am the truth. Not I am the obedience. Not I am the authority. I am the truth. How does adultery happen to a priest? Father Tim pointed out last week, adultery happens to a priest when truth in the mind of the priest is cohabiting and mingling with error in the mind of the same priest. If a man lives with a woman, we call that living in sin. A priest lives in sin when he has the truth in one side of his mind and error and heresy on the other. We cannot sleep with the modernists. We cannot be united with the modernists because if we are united with the modernists, the truth side will be destroyed by the lie side. What happens when a man sleeps with a woman that is not his wife? If there, first of all, there are no legitimate children. So likewise, when a priest mixes truth with lies, he can have no legitimate children of faith. The faith is dead. And furthermore, if there are children, they will be bastards. The new mass is a bastard mass. The new priests are bastard priests. Archbishop Lefebvre, I remember, he was back in the old days. You must remember the circumstances. If you believe in modernism, remember the circumstances. But if you're a Catholic, only remember the truth. And the truth is, Archbishop Lefebvre said, the new Mass is a bastard Mass. Why did he say it was a bastard Mass? Because it is a Mass in which a Catholic priest celebrates Protestant rites. Catholic, Protestant, cohabitating bastards. Adultery. What is going to happen? Maybe we're going to have to go back in the catacombs again. Many priests are afraid. Maybe we won't be able to come back to our rectories. Maybe we'll be driven out into the streets. There are many against in May of 2012. But when the act falls, how many will stay against? In 1965, 250 bishops at the end of the council said, we will stand firm against the council. 250 bishops. In 1969, Four years later, one of them founded a seminary. One out of 250. 
Later on, a second one stayed faithful in his diocese. Two out of 250. But in 65, they were all united. The SSPX is now, for the first time in its history, in a practical state of division. Even if Bishop Fillet doesn't sign the dotted line, even if the Pope doesn't come through with a miracle today, he'll come through with it tomorrow or next week. From now on, there's going to be liberal priests in the society, and there's going to be priests faithful to Archbishop Lefebvre. Up until this day, the smart priests and the stupid priests, young and old, lazy and hardworking, all of them believe the same faith. But now you will find two directions. Pope Benedict XVI is the master of disaster. He has been destroying and dividing tradition for the last 20 years, 30 years. Now he has Bishop Fillet in a diabolical disorientation. He has the bishop believing that the new friends in Rome are going to help him and he's going to help them become good Catholics. And he doesn't need his old friends anymore. He doesn't need the three bishops anymore. And you will see a purge. Barring a miracle, you will see a purge. This priest was ex expelled from the society because he's disobedient. That one because he's crazy. This one because, you know, we can't tell you. You don't want to know. We must stand firm for the faith. Many souls are in grave jeopardy today because Bishop Follet has decided to play with fire and smile. Because he's got the grace of state. Faith is greater than the grace of state to me. Faith is first. And the father of the family does not have the right to jeopardize his family. He doesn't have the right to tear it apart. He doesn't have the right to compromise. For what? What promises have they made him? They've lied to the others. They've destroyed the others. You know that Father Lagarin, the superior of the Good Shepherd Institute, which was started in 2006, he called Father de Cacre a month ago. Father de Cacre is the French priest that came here. Back in 2006, Father Lagre was in his church, and he wasn't going to leave it. Father de Cacre came in by himself. He walked up the center aisle with 250 people who were all behind Father, de Cacre, Father Lagre. He stood in front of all the people, and he said, Father Lagre, get out of this church. This is SSPX Church. You're not following our rules. Get out. And you people, get out. Father Lagare said, I am happy that you came to me like a man. And you spoke to me like a man. And you condemned me like a man. I go out. And he went out. Six years later, Father Lagre calls up Father de Cacre. His father, remember me? I'm the priest you threw out in the correct way that you should have done it. I am telling you, don't make a deal with Rome. I did. 
We made the deal six years ago, and now they're crushing us. You saw the document on March 23rd, where Cardinal Pozo the Clown commands us to live according to the spirit of the Mormon Pontificum, that we have to accept the new mass, that we have to incorporate the catechism of the Catholic Church into our seminary, that we have to teach modernism and crap in our seminary. We are trapped. But they told us six years ago, no conditions. I'm calling you because of the respect I have for you, because you treated me like a man. So I'm telling you. So Father de Cochray passed on the word to Bishop Fillet. He's not turning back. Also, the last part of this, according to Bishop William Fillet, the general chapter, which is going to meet in July, will not be a meeting to discuss an acceptance of the agreement, because it's already accepted. But simply to learn what the new statutes will be under the new agreement for Rome. We've got to go back to re-education classes. I'm not going to those classes. The faith does not need re-education. This may be my last Sunday in Dava. We do not know what will happen. The iron fist is above. Fear is below. But the truth is larger than both. Many of the faithful are afraid. All over the world. And lastly, let us consider Moses. After 40 days on the mountain, in fact it was 48 days, because he went up to the top of the mountain and prayed for 8 days, then he went to the higher part of the mountain and remained for 40 days. So in fact it was 48 days. At the end of the 40 days, he came down to the middle of the mountain where Joshua was waiting. And they began to walk down that mountain. And they heard noise like this in the background. And Joshua said to Moses, Moses, let us hurry to the camp, because I hear the sound of battle. I hear the sound of war down in the Jewish camp. Moses said, don't hurry. It's not the sound of war, Joshua. It's not the sound of battle, Joshua. It is the sound of laughter. It is the sound of the minstrels playing. It is the sound of my people Israel worshiping a golden calf. A golden calf that was made by my own brother Aaron. During the time that I was receiving the commandments and all the prescriptions of the old law from God. While I was talking to God over the last 40 days, they were talking to the devil. Joshua, you do not hear the sound of that. Now this is what we think. Menzingen is telling us, we're going to go in and fight. We're going to go in and do battle. We're going to go in and fight for the modernists. No, they're not. They're going to go in and drink with the modernists. They're going to go in and sing songs with the modernists. They're going to go in and play with the modernists. They're going to go in and worship the golden calf. Moses continued down the mountain. When he arrived at the bottom, they were all surprised to see him. And they were afraid.
And they were right to be afraid. It was a bad day to meet Moses. Moses came down that mountain and he said, These are the commandments I received from God. Here is their value in front of you. And he took those commandments and he threw them on the ground. And they broke into pieces. And then he said these words. Who is on the Lord's side? No argument. No theological discussion with the Jews. No telling the Jews all the beautiful things that happened on top of the mountain. He simply said, who is on the Lord's side? Whoever is on the Lord's side, come over here. Whoever is not, stand over there. And they divided. Still no theological discussions. Moses then pulled out a sword. And he said, those of you that are on the Lord's side, kill every one of them. Leave not one alive. And 40,000 were killed in that day. It was a bloody day. We are at a time in which arguments have already been made. They already know the tune of the modernists. They already know the tricks. And the modernists say, obedience, obedience over faith. We've heard those words before. Argument, though it must occasionally be done, is not the answer. Now we must decide who is on the Lord's side. There are two excommunicated bishops who remain excommunicated, and they're on the Lord's side. One of them is Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. He's on the Lord's side. The other is Bishop de Castelmeyer. He's on the Lord's side. And they're both excommunicated from the neo-modernist church. Are we afraid of excommunication? We should rather be afraid of offending God, not of excommunication. And lastly, we'll read from a letter, it takes a while to get to the bottom of it here, from some English Catholics of the Society of St. Pius X, an open letter to Bishop Pillay. We'll read here only the conclusion. A letter saying that we must stand for tradition. Bishop Fillet, which Bishop Fillet do we listen to? You? The one that said in 1999 that the council is erroneous and not just the hermeneutics of the council. Or the one in 2012 that says there's nothing wrong with the council, only the hermeneutics. Bishop Fillet in 99 said the council is wrong. Bishop Fillet in 2012 says the council is right. Which Bishop Fillet do we listen to? We will listen to the one that was faithful to Archbishop Lefebvre in Catholic tradition. Here is the conclusion of this long article, which you will not read. You can get it off the internet. It is our fervent hope, say these English Catholics, many that have signed and sent this letter on May the 19th. It is our fervent hope that the future of the SSPX and the future of tradition are, as in the days past, one and the same thing. It is our hope that SSPX continues to be the same as tradition. Whatever may be the case, however, 
We will do all within our power to believe and spread the truth, to denounce error, and in so doing, to remain faithful to our Lord and His Church, to tradition and the legacy of Archbishop Lefebvre. Whatever the cost, and whether Your Excellency chooses to abandon us or to remain with us. St. Pius X, Ora for Nobis. As Bishop Williamson used to say many times, the SSPX is a pilot light, carries the light of faith. If it should ever abandon that light, then we must abandon the SSPX. Bishop Filet, Bishop Lefebvre used to say, I teach you the truth. Follow it as long as I teach it. But if the day comes that I don't teach it anymore, then abandon me. For we must be followers of the truth. Followers of the faith. Now let us pray for a miracle. And the miracle is that enough priests and enough faithful stand up and preserve the legacy of the Society of St. Pius X, which is to continue to stand firm for the faith. And that Bishop Filet realizes and wakes up from his stupor and realizes that he's being deceived by the devil and come back to the firm teaching of the truth, to the firm condemning of error and strengthen us in that truth and continue to condemn the, error, condemn the errors and stay faithful to the legacy of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, the Society of St. Pius X, and what is necessary for the continuation of our Holy Church, the faith, the faith.